Hello. Okay, this is dangerous that I have this in my hand. Um, welcome. She is still signing a couple more books, but um, we are live streaming tonight for people who couldn't be here who, and who asked uh, that they have a chance to hear. So I, while she's finishing up, I'm going to go ahead and introduce her um, and tell you just a little bit. Probably a lot of you know as much, if not more, but um, we are really excited to have Tamara Alexander here tonight. Uh, she's, this is book number 16. Um, she is an amazingly gifted writer, because I'm thinking you're here and you know that. But um, one thing I love that we haven't talked about today, if you were here for some of the earlier sessions, she's written 16 books. 13 of them have been nominated for Christie Awards, and she's won three times. That's a really big deal. This is the highest award given for Christian historical fiction, plus lots of other awards. Go to her website. Uh, hopefully you grabbed a bookmark out there. It's got her website on it, and you can read a whole lot more about her. Um, People love her books. She is so good in drawing characters, writing, you know, building the characters, writing the plots. But probably one of my favorite things about her is she is so good at writing dialogue. Um, and you read sometimes books and you think, okay, they never talk to each other. How can they be in love? Well, she's going to let you see how the relationship happened. So I, I love that about her as well. Um, her books have been translated in lots of different foreign languages. Um, she's got a lot of uh, followers. But let me tell you some of the things that I love about her. I have known her since uh, college. I know we've got some Harding people in here tonight. Uh, she is married to one of my best friends. Our dads were both on the faculty at Harding, and his name was Alexander, as you would know, and my name was Alan. So back then at Harding, you always sat by the person. It was always alphabetical. So we sat together in chapel from sixth grade on. We sat together in every class, and we either had to kind of get along or kill each other. So I thought so highly of her husband and her, his family, and I wanted him to do well. He needed a really good wife, let's be honest, and he married very well, which was answered prayer. So I, I know her in a big way through Joe and my appreciation for her uh, for that. But they have two adult children, a girl and a son. Uh, they have two dogs, a brand new puppy dog who's been getting Joe up, it sounds like, throughout the middle of the night several times, so he's ready to get his wife back. She loves to cook and bake, and in my house she says, do you ever walk in this kitchen? But um, She is taking care of her father, who's four hours away from her. They live in Nashville. He's in Atlanta, and she goes there every two weeks and spends several days with him, trying to do all of the other things she does and write, and I love it that she's taking care of him um, at this time in his life. Um, I think this speaks volumes about her. She is a former church secretary, which I think, she definitely earned her extra wings in heaven. Um, one of my favorite things is she knows Beth Moore personally. So uh, I've received pictures from her saying, look, she's got gold shoes on and she knows my name. And so she, when she fans out for some of these people she knows, I get excited about that. And I told her I could probably make it up until she got up here. So I have a whole other page of things. If you want to know what her husband wrote about her, the top ten things that Joe thinks about her, they're really cute. Find me afterwards and I'll read them, but I don't want to take any more of her time. So let us pray for her and we will give her all the rest of the time. We'll have time hopefully for a Q&A. So if you see me running around again when you raise your hand, we want to make sure everybody could hear um, the questions. And then she will be back out. And if you got a number, she will sign books as soon as we are finished tonight. So uh, will you join me in welcoming Tammy Alexander? Do you want to come? Dear Father, thank you so much for bringing us here tonight. And we know some people have driven uh, a long way and several hours, and we are so grateful for their presence. And we'd ask that you give all of us safety as we head back home. But, Father, thank you for Tamara, for her ministry, for her walk with you. Um, thank you that um, she's very genuine and that uh, she doesn't make any steps without your guidance and your spirit telling her what to do. And we are so grateful. Um, for what you mean in her life and what she means in our lives. And uh, we thank you for her wisdom, for her example, and we'd ask that we be followers of you and uh, supportive of her. And please uh, just give her your words tonight as she speaks to us. We are grateful to belong to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Amen and amen. It is wonderful to be with y'all, and as we've been um, visiting out in the lobby, um, a few of you laughed when I said this, but we did a Southern Mansion Reader Weekend, the first one this past November 30th and December the 1st, and that's where um, we did br uh, dinner at Belmont Mansion, breakfast at Belmead, and then dinner at Carnton. And um, we, could, we could hold about 91 readers, but I have to tell you, and again, y'all laughed, it's like holding a party and wondering if anyone is going to come. But y'all just, it was amazing. Within about three weeks, we had sold out, and we had those readers come, and we just had the best time. Bobby, I'm looking, and I know some of y'all, uh, three others from here, were they from here? Or were you other friends? other friends, but we just had the best time. Um, but all that to say, I just want to thank you for reading my stories. Writing is something that I never thought I would do. Um, it was, and I'll get into a little bit to the writing journey in just a second, but I also want to say hello, not only to y'all, but to the live stream. Uh, y'all are so just techy. Look at, look at us live streaming. So, so all of you out there, um, thank you so much, and thank you for reading my books and for welcoming me. Um, into your into your to your homes and to your hearts on vacation someone wrote me yesterday and said I took you with me on vacation I was like yay where did we go this is great this is wonderful so I've had a great day of meeting sisters in Christ today we um, had a little in your Bible study this morning we had a great time and we talked about posturing ourselves um, in order to hear the Lord this year and that's something I'm really trying be more cognizant about is listening and posturing my life um, to hear the Lord because after all as I say at the end of my books and almost every author note it's all about him is it not it's all about him I'm going to take a few minutes tonight to talk about writing and my journey in writing, but I really want to focus on the lessons that God has taught me in writing these novels. I won't go over every novel because there are 16 now, but I'm going to just going to touch some highlights. And really, even Cindy and I were talking about something tonight. And I shared something with her, and she said, I didn't know that about you. And so all of these stories um, that God has placed upon my heart are from lessons, maybe it's a faith struggle um, that I've been having in my life or uh, just a journey, a, a question that God has been working with me on. So we'll get to that in just a minute. I do want to say thank you especially to Logos um, Bookstore for coming and selling and selling these books and for setting everything up. And um, I want to thank Cindy. I'm not sure. I think they were back there. It was so funny. We put, I'm wearing kind of a yoga pants not to be over you know TMI but there was you know, they said let's put this in your pocket and I was like well there's not a pocket so I didn't hear your intro but I guess did you tell them that you and Joe were friends growing up and um, I was asking Joe I said so how do you how do you know you and Cindy y'all knew each other and all that stuff growing up? he said we sat by each other in chapel for our entire lives because uh, they were it was alphabetical so Alan and Alexander but I'm just so grateful that God actually brought us back into each other's lives again. You've been a real encouragement to me. And is she, those of you who go here, is she not an amazing preacher's wife? Isn't she? I told her, I said, I've known a lot of preacher's wives, let me tell you. And you rock it. You're just doing, you just, just do, do so well. Um, let's see, with this pledge, released yesterday, and I have to say, with every book, it's always exciting when a book releases, but with this book especially, there has been a huge whew, factor with this one. Um, I'm glad that God gave me 15 books before this one to um, hone my writing skills, because this one really challenged me. Everybody in this book is real. There were many moments, many moments late at night, alone in my office, um, neck deep in, honestly, gut-wrenching battle history of the Civil War when I wondered, number one, why did I ever think I could write this story? Why did I ever do it? And then I just felt, I felt so intimidated by writing about Captain Roland Ward Jones, who was a Mississippi Civil War um, sharpshooter, and Elizabeth Clouston, who was the governess there at Carnton. But among all of that heartbreaking history were also amazing glimpses of hope. I have read countless diary after diary of personal accounts um, from these soldiers um, 
And it was just, it's just amazing what faith-filled men and women they were and what, as a country, we looked so different back in that era than we, than we do today. Um, and just a little housekeeping. I want to make sure I answer whatever questions you have tonight. So if you think of a question as I'm going along, tuck it in your memory, uh, jot it down, whatever. But we'll, I'll be sure to leave uh, time, time for us at the, at the very end. Um, first of all, I want to introduce you to the people who um, kind of make my world go round. Um, we'll talk about my family, my husband Joe, and our son uh, Kurt, and our daughter Kelsey, and our dog Murphy. He's seen in the picture there with me eating my earring. He loves earrings. I've lost more earrings. I've got one of many set of earrings. Um, and then there's Bailey, and, I, and we've, we've been kidding. Um, our children are not are not married yet. My daughter's, again, 31, and Kurt's 29, so if you have single sons or daughters of that age, come see me afterward. I, although Kurt, Kurt might be taken. Carol and I this morning, a lady I met this morning, we've already, we, we're already planning, we're already plotting. So, um, but we are a Belmont family. My husband teaches at Belmont. Our children went to Belmont, and I write about Belmont. So, um, and recently, I know on Facebook, I asked some of y'all if, um, you know, if it was easy having two dogs as opposed to one, and they were like, oh, it is so easy. You still go for all the walks. But for all of you right now with Bailey getting up at 2 in the morning, wanting to go poop and all that stuff, I want to find you and slap you silly. So if you're out there live streaming, I'm coming for you. I am coming for you. And the next person... And if you follow me again on social media, several of y'all, as we were signing books, y'all said you're praying for my dad, and I so appreciate that. That's another journey that Cindy and I have in common with our dads and with dementia. And um, uh, he's doing well. He's doing, has good days and bad days, but I think today was a pretty good day, which was good. Um, that's a picture of them shaking hands. Dad sits at a four top with three other gentlemen, and one of them is 96, and he was World War II. One of them was uh, Vietnam. Not more, and then there's Dad, and then there, and then there's Leroy who just plays golf, and he and Dad just have a great time. But so I, we're not supposed to take pictures of the other, you know, residents. So I took the, I took a picture of their hands. But that happens every time they sit down for a meal. They shake hands and hug, and then and then and then uh, Bill, who, who's 96, after they eat, he'll say, "So um, Doug, who is my dad, he said, so racquetball at 9:30." Dad's like racquetball at 9:30, and then if you don't, if you don't know about the Echo Show, just a quick 30 second. If you have someone, that's the middle picture. Dad and I are able to talk via video that way several times a day, and it's such a blessing. See me afterward, and I'll tell you about it. Ah, oh, my sweet mother-in-law Claudette. Are there any of you in here who knew Claudette? Some of you. All right, you're raising your hand. She was, um, she was the dream mother-in-law. She really was, and I would not be writing today um, without Claudette. First, though, I have to tell you that arranged marriages are still around. Um, when I was at Harding, Claudette was my girls' club sponsor, so for graduation, I wanted my mom, June, to meet Claudette, so the five of us, Claudette and her husband, Fred, and then me and my parents, we got together for breakfast, and mother, my mother, June, and Claudette just hit it off, just loved each other, and at the end of breakfast, my mother leans over and she said, I wish you had a son, and Claudette it said, I do. I do have a son. So that was, sorry, Joe, if you're listening, honey, you were, it was slayed. We were done. We were done at that point because our, our mothers got along and I adored, I adored Claudette. So it was a, it was a done deal. But Claudette was my girls club sponsor. And so she always was, um, was very, very involved in our, in our lives and with our grandchildren. And she was always just a wonderful influence as far as um, teaching our kids to, to read. And Claudette really started me um, on my road writing. She gave me a novel. And um, she said, I think you'll love this. I think you'll love it. But I took one look at the cover and it had a chicken on it. It had maybe a hen. And please forgive me, all my Amish writers who I love, my buddies, but it had a bonnet on it. And I don't know, at that time in my life, it just didn't, it didn't take my interest. But as Southern women, what do we do when someone gives us a gift? Thank you so much. Yes, and you, you, did, you know, really do that little inflection. But I didn't really have any intention of reading it. I shelved it. 
and she comes back and asks me, have you read that book? And I said, not yet, but it's right on the top of my stack. And then we get a call, and we're living in Colorado, and I get a call, and Claudette, who is a middle school librarian, had, we were told, had died of a brain aneurysm. About an hour earlier, what had happened was she had had a really bad headache. She called Fred, my father-in-law, said, Fred, this is the worst headache I've ever had in my life. Could you come? And he said, I'll be there in 20, 25 minutes as soon as I can get there. And he found her on the floor of her office in the middle school library, and she was taken to Vanderbilt, but she was never, never resuscitated. Um, and talk about rocked our world. She was 58 talk so young when I'm I'm 57 so as I'm approaching it's getting younger all the all the time uh, move move ahead a few months and I find the novel she gave me and um, I absolutely loved it I sat down and read it that afternoon from cover to cover uh, speed ahead a, a, a few months and I'm reading all the Christian fiction I can I can find which back in 1995 is is not much but we're driving back from Texas one night and um, a couple years have passed maybe and I'm finishing a book I toss it in the back seat and I turned to Joe and I said I think I could write I think I could write one of those and he said well why don't you we've always been slightly competitive my husband and I so I said well all right I will I'll do it um, so like Snoopy you know it was a dark and stormy night a shot rang out a little I just had no idea what I was doing but I spent two years writing a book you know so I kind of started writing a little bit on a on a dare um, and also my mom, my sweet mom, she went home to be, in G home to be with Jesus in 2009 after a six-month battle with gallbladder cancer. So I like to think that she and Claudette are up there now just arranging marriages and relationships to their heart's content. Um, lastly, someone I want to thank, um, actually two more, is uh, the group. It's called the, we call ourselves the CDA Gals, the Coeur d'Alene Gals. We meet every summer in July for five days to plot, to play, and to pray. We pray for each other's careers. We help each other plot each other's next books. And then we just play and have an absolutely great time. This is on the first day, I think, of the retreat. And this is on the last day. Um, yeah, so, but we just have a, we have a wonderful time. Um, it's Francine Rivers, Brandlin Collins, Sonny Jeffers, Trisha Goyer, Janet Albright, Sharon Dunn, Sandy Shepard, Gail DeSales, Karen Ball, Robin Lee Hatcher, and me. And we've been doing this since um, 2003. And it's such a, such a fun time. So fun. And then one person that literally I could not write without is Deb Rainey. Have any of y'all read a Deb Rainey book? Yep. She's a wonderful author, and she, is, um, she has helped me so much in, in my writing career. And I'm also grateful. I'm also grateful for my publishers. I've published with Thomas Nelson and Zondervan, who are now HarperCollins and Bethany House, for all of my 16 books. And I'm grateful for those editors. Um, you can't write without an editor. If there are any writers in here, I talked to one of you earlier. I hear a lot from, a, um, from writers, young writers, saying, I'm afraid the editor will change my voice. Nonsense. An editor takes your voice and makes it shine where it could never do that on your own because you need perspective as a writer and it's a wonderful thing. The Southern novels, those are my last few novels. My first seven were Colorado Territory, and I love that because we lived in Colorado, so I wrote all about the places where we had lived, but the Southern novels consist of the Belmont Mansion novels, the Bell Mead Plantation novels, and the, and the Carnton uh, novels, and the first full length, of course, is with, with this pledge that, that released yesterday. And I really felt like I came home when I started writing Southern fiction. I'm born and raised in Atlanta, and um, my youngest memory of really loving history was when I was nine years old, my family went to Europe. Now, before you think, whoa, you went to Europe, it was great. It was a wonderful trip, but my dad couldn't go because he had to work. So my mother, my grandmother, my brother, and I went, and we met my aunt and uncle who were stationed over there in Frankfurt, and then their two children. And the eight of us toured for a month in a Volkswagen bug. All the luggage was packed on the was packed on the top, and I sat in the cubby hole. And then the, my mother and brother and grandmother in the back seat, and aunt and uncle and the kids we passed around. Apparently, we did not care whether they lived or died. Um, they just passed around. But I remember running my hand along the side of a, I believe it was a 12th or 13th century castle. And at that young age, even at nine years old, there was just a thrill that went through me about history and walking in the steps that people had 
walked in so so long ago and hearing their journeys um, so that's really where it started for me and then on Sunday night after youth group uh, there was a house in Atlanta we call it the Coke mansion now because that's where some of the people who own the who own Coke live but back then it was a boarded up old mansion and we would go and if you knew where to go in the back we would kind of shinny in through some boards and you could, we took our flashlights and we never did, you know, we didn't do anything to the property. Some people are like, oh, that is a sin. You were trespassing. Okay, that probably was, you're right, it was a sin. But we didn't, we didn't vandalize. It was just, again, such a thrill and part of that history that really, um, that really took, took depth inside me. In the mid-19th century, three families lived in Nashville and Franklin area in, the, uh, in, in Tennessee, and they're pictured here in this image. There's Joseph and Adelicia Acklin of Belmont Mansion. Adelicia Hayes, Franklin Acklin Cheatham was her name, and she was married three times. Her first two husbands died. General, Jill, uh, General William Giles Harding and his wife Elizabeth McGavick Harding. Um, and then John and Carrie McGavick of Carnton. And you'll notice that Elizabeth in the middle from Harding, um, Elizabeth McGavick Harding from Belmead, Elizabeth McGavick Harding, and then the McGavicks from Carnton, she was John's sister. So there was a connection there. These three couples, they lived their lives, they raised their children, most of them buried far more children than, than they raised. These people dreamed dreams, they succeeded, they failed, they enlarged houses, um, they built homes elsewhere, um, they, they amassed wealth, um, of course, and Adelicia, more than any of the others, um, she had more slaves. She had close to 700 slaves. The McGavicks had uh, right at 42, and then the Hardings had about 47. But I think it's interesting. I think it's, um, I think it's crucial that we realize as we walk through these places that, yes, are part of our history, um, that we realize the full history behind these and what those cost so many people. Bell Mead, of all of them, has done a wonderful job at um, tracking down the slaves, the former slaves who lived there. But there, so we know very little about the others. Um, and some of those were, Bel Belmont had a fire years earlier where a lot of the history was just damaged to no fault of theirs. But if you've read any of the Belmead novels, you know about Uncle Bob, Robert Greene. Have any of you read the, Bel the Belmead novel? So you know all about Uncle Bob. Um, here he is in the customary, um, white apron that he always wore. He was the head hostler, the head horse trainer at Belmead Plantation and truly was um, just a remarkable man. And how the scene opens in To Whisper Her Name where it has Uncle Bob hiding thoroughbreds. When I lived in Colorado and I'd just written this book, I got messages from Colorado. There's no way he could hide these horses in, you know, in, like in the Rocky Mountains. I was like, the, ten you know, the mountains in Tennessee and Georgia, for that matter, are not like the mountains in Colorado. Yes, he could. You could hide armies just over a hill and all that densely treed area. But he did that, and that is the only reason General William Giles Harding had thoroughbreds after the Civil War, period. There would have not been a Bell Mead without Uncle Bob Green. And if we can do this, I want to show you, I didn't ask them, how do I make a video play? Let's see if this will work. Did I just turn it off? Oh, are you going to have to come and plug my belt in again? Okay. Can you play the video from there? Or can I? There we go. Oh, do we have sound? This is the old Harding cabin where John and Susanna Harding first lived upon establishing Bell Mead in 1807. As you can see, the dwelling consists of two cabins connected by a dog trot, what we would call a breezeway today. The cabin is quite modest when compared to the larger home the Hardings built 13 years later, what we now call the Bell Mead Mansion. True to history, this is where Bob Green, an African American slave and the head hostler at Bell Mead, lived for many, many years. The old Harding cabin also plays a role in the setting of my novel To Whisper Her Name because this is where Lieutenant Ridley Cooper, a Southern-born son who chose to fight for the Union, lives in the story as well. Bob Green was only two years old when he first arrived at Belmead with his parents who, along with him, 
were a wedding gift to the first Mrs. William Giles Harding, along with a family Bible. This seems incomprehensible to us today, and with good reason. But I think it's important not to forget the past, not only so we won't repeat it, but so that the men and women who gave so much and from whom so much was taken won't be forgotten. As I said, there would not have been a Bellmead Plantation without him. But to bring it to current day, how many of you have heard of Secretariat, Seattle Slough, Sunday Silence, American Pharaoh, I'll Have Another, Bramble, Bonnie Scotland, all of these Kentucky Derby winners trace their lineage back to Bellmead Plantation um, to the 1870s. And not only all the Kentucky Derby winners, but every horse, every thoroughbred that's run in the Kentucky Derby for the last 30 plus years traces its lineage back um, basically to, Bob's, to Uncle Bob's talent and to his life's work. And that's quite an accomplishment. I'm often asked whatever happened to Uncle Bob. His only wish was that he could live out his days at Bellmead, and then he wanted to be buried at Bellmead. Unfortunately, in around 1904, the, um, the family lost the Bellmead estate, so Uncle Bob had to move off. But he was granted his, his wish to, to be buried back at, back at Bellmead, and he was, unfortunately, we have no idea where he was buried on the estate. It was a large estate. So um, we keep hoping one of these days that maybe his, his grave um, will be found. But I think it's so important not to forget our history. And that's part of the reason why I write historical fiction is I love history, but I also want to share history. Some people may not necessarily pick up a history book and read it, but they would read a novel and we gain. I know I gain from that too. So when we study history, we learn so many things about why we are where we are in this country and as a nation. And we also realize that human nature has never and never will change. We are, uh, we are a sinful people. Um, we are sinful creatures. Thank you, God, for the gift of Jesus. In studying history, we also realize that life, I do, is amazingly short. Um, just those couples I, I showed you earlier, they lived lives, they had dreams, and they're gone, just gone. And it's amazing. And the older I get, the, the, more I, the more I feel that. But everyone who lives, everyone, everyone leaves footprint, footprints behind us, um, impressions of their life. And if there's one thing I've learned in researching these several Southern novels is that it is so important to leave something lasting behind us, which has caused me to question again and again, what am I leaving behind? What am I leaving behind that is going to last? And every novel that I've written is a nugget, as I mentioned to you, a life lesson, a spiritual lesson that God has taught me. Sometimes a novel has started, as I said, with a faith struggle. Um, years ago, during a time of fasting and prayer, I was seeking God's face about what to do with this writing thing. I, had, I wasn't published yet. I had gone to a conference, a writer's conference, and the editor, I'd shown her my first two or three chapters, and she'd ask for the full, the full novel. And I said, I don't have it written yet, but I will. She said, send it, you know, send it to me when you're, when you're done. So um, I went home from that writer's conference, determined to finish. I was up there on Sunday, and um, the praise team had just finished. Um, I was on the praise team, and we had just finished singing. I was making my way to the seat, and we had just finished singing the potter's song, or the potter's hand, mold me, make me, I give my life to the potter's hand. And I was like, yes, Lord, I'll do this, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was making my way to the seat, and the preacher started praying, so I stopped. And as clearly as if you were standing beside me and had whispered something, I heard, would you write this book if you knew you were writing it only for me? I've heard the audible, inaudible voice of God maybe five times in my life. And so, it's, I mean, there's that ah moment. You're like, ah, this is amazing. And then the very human part of me kicked in, and I thought, wait a minute. <laughs> wait just a minute. And I heard the voice. He asked the question again, would you write this book? if you knew you were writing it only for me. And the woman who, the old woman inside of me who should have been drowned a long time ago when I was baptized, raised up, she rears her ugly head, and I had a pretty good idea about what God was telling me in that moment. I was gonna, you know, I knew God held my dream about writing, that was never a question, but I knew I was gonna write that book, spend months writing that book, and that specific editor who asked for it, she wasn't gonna take it. I just knew it in my gut. But 
I spent the next few months writing that book as though I were writing it for an audience of one and sent it in. And she said no. The editor said no. She didn't take it. But I had learned something huge in that, is that every no along the way is really part of God's final yes when his perfect timing is reached. That is something that's true in marriage. It's true with our children. It's true in our jobs. It's true in our walk with the Lord. Um, and I knew that because five months later after, or five years later after that, I tucked that story in the drawer and thought, you know, what if I really try to learn what on earth I'm doing instead of just off the cuff? So I studied writing on my own. I dissected my favorite novels. And that, how many of you have read Redeeming Love by Francine Rivers? Of course we all have. It is absolutely one of the best um, inspirational Christian uh, fiction out there. But I dissected my favorite novels, trying to figure out what this writing thing was all about. Then I had published four books, and my agent, Natasha Kern, calls and one morning. We had just moved to Nashville, and she says, Thomas Nelson called, and they have the Women of Faith fiction line, and they're, you know, the conferences that they do, but they also had a fiction line to go with that, and they want you to write the first historical. It's like, that is amazing. Yes, let's do that. And they said, and, and she said, and they need it in five months. I said, that is impossible. I can't do that because I already have my writing schedule, and there was just no time. So she said, you know, Tammy, if there's any way you can do this, you don't want to. The marketing potential, yada, yada. But you can only do what you can do. So um, I said, you know, oh, my word. And she said, don't you have anything tucked in a drawer in something, anything? And I said, Hmm, I do have a book, and she said, and I knew where it was because we had just moved, so I still had the printed out um, copy, and she said, um, why don't you work up a proposal and get that ready and, you know, see what you think, and I said, okay, I said, I can do that, and I said, when do you need it? She said, 7, 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. It's like, are you kidding me? She said, no, they have a pub board. One author dropped out. She lost her slot. So this is your, this is it. You got to do it. So I went and found the book, stayed up until around 4, 4.30 in the morning, wrote the proposal. And as God would have it, again, his timing is perfect. I had just finished reading, again, history book, about Chinese Asian Americans in American culture and how they built the railroad through the Rocky Mountains. And Thomas Nelson wanted a different ethnicity in the book. So I wrote that, got it off by 10 o'clock that same morning. They faxed me my contract, and I started writing that book, wrote it in about four and a half months. And that's still one of my best sellers. Every no along the way is part of God's final yes when his perfect timing is reached. It just, um, and the second thing I learned is that this is, is, the, is that you're never too old to start something new. At my first, is what was called a um, ICRS, the International Christian Retail Show, which that's kind of gone by the wayside now, or it's not as nearly as big as it used to be, but I was at my first show, and we were, I was about to sign books, and a publicist came up, and she said, you're awfully, you know, you're kind of old to be starting this writing thing, and I thought, good grief, you little snippy little thing, I'm only, I was 44 at the time, and I thought, oh my word, but you know, what I learned again is, if God is at the helm of that dream, you are never Never too old to start something new. Follow his lead. Um, is there something you've been thinking about doing? A business you want to start? Maybe a book you want to write? Um, I would encourage you to do that. Seek God's face on it and follow his lead because you're never too old to start something new. God also taught me to, and writing has taught me to prepare for a journey um, because God rarely takes the shortest route. One of my favorite Bible verses is in Exodus, which people always say, Exodus, really? But it's in Exodus 13, 17 through 18. When Pharaoh finally let the people go, God did not lead them along the main road that runs through Philistine territory, even though that was the shortest route to the promised land. God said, if the people are faced with a battle, they might change their minds and then return to Egypt. So God led them in a roundabout way through the wilderness toward the Red Sea. Thus the Israelites left Egypt like an army ready for battle. God knew what the Israelites needed and he knows what you and I need. So don't be surprised if he leads us down roads that we don't want to go or that we would never choose for ourselves, maybe choose for our children. He ultimately knows what is best and what's best for our eternal good. And to that end, he's taught me many lessons, and some of them through um, have, have made their way into my novels. Um, Rekindled, let's see. Rekindled, which was the first book, um, first published book. It was my second 
written book, but first published book, is about expectation in marriage. I was, um, I'm often asked, you know, don't you hate that God, you know, you wasted those 20 years working in, in marketing and management. I was like, are you kidding? My first book was about expectation in marriage. I could not have written that without 20 years of marriage underneath my belt. Um, and I just love that God uses, my husband and I, we jokingly don't count that first year of marriage. We count it now because there's been enough distance from it. If you, those of you are married, you get my drift. Um, but at first we were like, yeah, let's don't count that one. That was really hard. I never heard my parents fight. I never, never a raised voice. And I got into marriage and thought, what? This is not always fun. And I may still love him, but I'm just not crazy about him right now, quite frankly. I'm not, I'm not sure. And Joe, I love you now. I love you. And, but the thing was, I was the very same way. I was not easy to live with. Of course, now I'm a jewel to live with. Yeah, I'm sure. So, but God impressed a truth on my heart that a husband is to love his wife like Christ, loved the, Christ loves the church. That's what the Bible tells us. A woman is supposed to respect her husband. And I needed to learn to love my husband for who he is not for who I wanted him to be. We women, we are fixers. We like to fix things, and that doesn't work well in marriage. The Holy Spirit, that's his job. Um, as far as I know, there's not an assistant Holy Spirit, although I've applied for that job many times. Um, Anyway, incidentally, um, I was encouraged, for you writers in here, I was encouraged by many people not to write a married romance for my first, to try to, my first published book for Rekindle. I was told it wouldn't sell. I was told um, there's not a market for that. But God had given me that story. He gave me that opening scene in a dream. It was of a man coming home on horseback. He stopped by a cabin, obviously couldn't find what he was looking for, went to a place in town, saw a funeral going on. There were only two people there at the funeral, and in his mind he was thinking, what kind of life does someone live where they only have two people at their funeral? The people go away. He goes over there, leans down, and the name on the cross is his name. And that's what I woke up with. That was the story within me, and then God took it from there. So follow God's lead. Take that counsel and sift it, but if it doesn't match what God says, go with God. He always, he always knows. And thank y'all for receiving. Two or three of y'all said Rekindled was your first book of mine. And so thank you for reading so, so faithfully. The second book in that um, series, Revealed, um, is, a, is a lesson that took me completely by surprise. That story is about a reformed prostitute. It also has a story thread of sex trafficking children in that book. What I didn't see until I was well into writing the story is that God wanted to heal me of some scars left behind from sexual abuse in my background as a young girl, um, ages about five, six, and seven for two or three years there. And I'm always very quick to add, my, um, my abuser was not in my family. That comes with a whole layer of hurt and stuff to deal with. It was someone outside of the family. Um, but God met me on the pages of that book in ways that I thought, I thought I'd put that behind me and God just, oh, it was just amazing. So these, you know, I often say worship is a form of writing for me, and it is, but it's a way that I meet Jesus, and I, he meets me on the page. Um, he's just so faithful, and I learned in an even deeper way that God is a restorer, and he loves, he delights in mending broken things. He always has. That's, that, that's who he is. He never wastes a tear. He never wastes a hurt ever, 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 ever. Beyond this moment, the second book in the Timber Ridge Reflection series is the story of a woman in 1875 who gets pregnant outside of marriage and must then come to terms with the consequences of her decisions, which is part of my family heritage. My precious Aunt Jenny, my dad's older sister, who I love dearly, was always very special to me. And this is a slide of Aunt Jenny and dad uh, just before dad left for, uh, to go over to Korea. I loved all of my dad's sisters, Aunt Jenny, Aunt Lida, Aunt Frances, and Aunt Maddie. They were wonderful. Um, but Aunt Jenny, there was something really special about her. She never missed a birthday card. And I went and stayed with her and Uncle Leonard for two weeks out of the summer. They had a, a farm in Tennessee, which for this Atlanta gal to milk chickens, and, or milk chickens, that would really be something, to milk cows and to do the chicken, I know, um, and to, to feed the pigs. That was just huge for me. It was huge. And it wasn't until I was around 19 or 20 when I got older that I learned that Aunt Jenny was really my dad's mom. 
And so she was my aunt, but she was really my grandmother. And my granny, who was my grandmother, was really my great-grandmother. Aunt Jenny had had dad at the age of 15 out of wedlock, and she had wanted to marry the man who had gotten her pregnant. Granny and Pa said, absolutely not. You're not going to do this. She was heartbroken. Uh, Granny and Pa raised dad as their son. And um, Aunt Jenny went on, went on to marry Uncle Leonard, who was a wonderful man, and they had two sons. But we didn't know until much, much later, and I wished Aunt Jenny had known this before she passed, but we only learned it in the last five or six years when Dad actually reconnected, or I should say connected, with the man, of the son of that original man. We found out, Dad called me one day and he said, can you find this, I want to I talk to that half-brother. And I thought, ooh, are we really sure this is a great idea? But I found him. You can find anybody on Google. And Dad called him, and they actually met. And the man said, you got the better end of the deal. He was cruel. Your granny and pa were right. Again, every no along the way, God is watching out for us. Even in those times when the no's of life are so hard to take, um, God is working, though it may not feel like it at the time. The theme of Within My Heart, um, the, the third book in uh, the series, was what do you do when God chooses uh, not to heal? Hang on one second. I think I've gotten... There we go. Um, I was about halfway through this book, Within My Heart, when uh, Mother, when my mom was diagnosed with gallbladder cancer. And so now the story became very personal for me. What do you do when God chooses not to heal? Um, And many of my and mom's last moments are in that third book in that series, Within My Heart. One of the lessons I learned during that six months journey, walking home with uh, walking mom home, was um, actually something a dear friend of ours, Judy McMahon, um, told me when, and she and I are pictured here, When we learned that there were no more medical options uh, for mom with gallbladder cancer, I called Judy to tell her, because again, she and mom were close, and Judy and I were close. And Judy told me something. She said, Tammy, remember, the person dying gets to choose. They get to choose. Up up to now, you have, you've, you know, you need to eat, mom. You need to eat. You need to do this. And she said, the person dying gets to choose. That phrase and that trusted counsel shaped the story and within my heart. I just, I, honestly, I just kind of began again and wrote that story differently. And it also shaped my final precious um, days with mom. And incidentally, Judy in this picture had been struggling for 13 years already with cancer. She struggled for a total of 17 and then she went home about um, three years ago. So... Um, I don't know about y'all, but heaven's shores are getting crowded with a lot of people that we've said goodbye to. Amen? Amen. Look forward to being together again someday soon. Um, In a lasting impression, basically I heard God one day just telling me, I know who you really are. I want you to stop pretending. I want you to be more authentic with yourself, with others, but mainly with me. And out of that heavenly counsel grew a story about an art forger who comes to live through a series of circumstances, comes to live for the richest woman in America at the time, which was Adelicia Acklin at Belmont Mansion. And then The Inheritance that I mentioned early, my first written book, but my fifth published book, um, has a prayer that's prominently featured in this, and it's one that God impressed upon me to pray after showing me that I needed to be much more grateful for what I had in my life. One morning, I dropped our son, Kurt, off for kindergarten, and I had headed back to the house to get ready for work. We lived in Colorado at the time, and it had started to um, snow that morning. Uh, incidentally, I was a church secretary. Any, any fellow church secretaries in here? Oh, my word, sisters, kinship, kinship. That's, I did that for eight years, I think. It was a very interesting, rewarding, challenging um, job. So thank you. Thank you for all you do. I dropped Kurt, Kurt off at kindergarten, ran back home on my way back to work, um, and I passed the elementary school, and I saw in the snow this sweet little boy walking back, all bundled up, uh, chin tucked into his chest, and I thought, What on earth kind of mother lets her little boy just walk back and it was Kurt. It was Kurt and I had left him. It's gone like, what on earth? So I stopped the car in the middle of the road 
He just then, I get out of the car, he sees me, our eyes connect, and he's starting to come toward me, and there's a semi coming on that side of the road right by him. And I just remember, you know how those moments where your life flashes, your breath just, you know, your heart sinks, and I just screamed for him to stop, just stop where you are. It took an eternity for that semi to pass. He stayed where he was, and he took a, then he took a step off the curb, and I just grabbed him. You know, where you want to just beat the daylights out of him and just don't even call child services, but you really just want to pop him, and um, but yet you're just holding him so close because of what you could have lost in that, in that moment. And... Um, oh my goodness, he was coming home, he had forgotten, he was told me through sobs that he had forgotten his show and tell, and he was coming back to get it, and all that, but um, that night as I tucked him in, into bed, I just thought, and I had been going through a time where I was like, oh, these kids are just, you know, just so busy, and blah, 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 and I realized, I thought, this is, this is my main job right now, is raising these children, and I just said, Lord, would you, would you help me to be more grateful? And the Holy Spirit, again, one of those times, has said, break me, Lord, until I'm wholly yours. And just impressed upon me that that's a prayer that I needed to pray, to break me, Lord, until I'm wholly yours. And that made its way. That was really the crux of this book, of the inheritance. Um, I've prayed it for Joe. I've prayed it for my kids. Um, every day since then for the, past, um, for the past 25 years. Joe, at times, is like, you know, are you still praying that prayer? I want you to stop. I want you to stop. Something's going on. It's too hard. Just stop. Um, but the prayer and that desire is threaded into the inheritance. And lastly, uh, some lessons I learned while writing with this pledge, a Carnton novel, the book that released me, or the, that, that did actually release me yesterday. It was so good to have that done. Um, I wrote and rewrote with this pledge. The first time, at the first draft, I turned it in. Jocelyn, if you were listening, you are amazing. Jocelyn ba Bailey, my editor on this book, she turned it back and she said, yeah, this is not working. So I rewrote it and I turned it in a second time. Yeah, it's still not working. I was like, good grief. So I took some time, took a deep breath, really looked at everything. And sure enough, I realized what she was saying, went back and wrote that book a third time. I was so intimidated about writing about real people, about Captain Roland Ward Jones and Elizabeth Clouston. This is a true story. It's a true battle. Everyone who is in the book is real. All the men who are in the house that night, the first 14 chapters um, are about the aftermath of the Battle of Franklin and roughly the three days after that. On the night of November 30th of 1864, 20,000 Confederate soldiers met 20,000 federal soldiers. The federal soldiers had had an eight-hour lead, so they had time to entrench around the Carter House in um, Franklin, Tennessee. They were ready. General Schofield of the Federal Army was ready for General Hood. They had been classmates at West Point. General Schofield graduated top of his class. Hood, General Hood for the Confederate Army, um, graduated at the bottom of his class. To say most historians think there was a competition there, absolutely. Hood saw his last opportunity, they think, to get at Schofield because if Schofield made it across the swollen Harpeth River and got to Nashville, the war was done. Nashville had 70,000 federal troops. Grant had Lee tied up in Virginia. There was no other mobile army within the Southern Theater. The war would have been over. So Hood attacked straight on. A, a charge that was two miles, um, two miles long, twice the length of Pickett's, and twice the, of Pickett's charge, and twice as many men as Pickett's charge. And Hood just sent them all straight on, and the Federal Army literally just mowed them down. So the aftermath, Carnton is, is one of the Confederate hospitals. It was the largest Confederate hospital there at that time. And literally the home, it just transformed in a matter of minutes to a hospital. And some of those men were there for about six or seven months. And this is their story. Um, one of the most wonderful things, though, about writing this story is Carnton allowed me, um, and I got in touch with, reached out to Captain Roland Ward Jones to his great, 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 great grandson, David Doty. And David, if I told him about the live stream tonight, if you're listening, thank you so, so much. But David shared not only the family history with me, but all of the love letters between Elizabeth 
and Roland, and Roland and his first wife, Susan Hairston. So all of that history, um, all of the diaries that from the men who did survive that night or who survived for you know a few weeks after that, but yet who died at Carnton, all of those um, are incorporated in, into this book. So so much of what you read literally is real history. And um, if you do love knowing truth from fiction, you can go on my website after you've read the book. Don't go there before. Don't be one of those people who goes and reads. A friend, Nyla, if you're listening in Colorado, she would always read the last chapter first. What on earth are you thinking? But I love you. Um, but anyway, so truth or fiction, but there are major spoilers in those documents. But if ever you want to know something in one of my novels that's truth or fiction, you can, you can go there. But um, really the history of Carnton just captured me, not only the McGavocks, but also their, um, their cook that was there with them um, for a long time. So it was the living, breathing memory of what happened there that, that really pulled me in, and um, I'm grateful for the timing and being able to write that story. In writing historical fiction, I'm often, I'm often asked, how, how do you do your research? And I could not have done the research I did on this book without so many people around me. All of the mansion, the curators, the directors, have they just give me, just open every everything up and open the files, but also give me access to the houses, which again is so huge in getting inspiration. So, and let me show you, oh, that's the prayer, break me, Lord, until, I holy, until I'm wholly yours. Um, David Doty and his dad, Roland Ward Jones II, and Roland Ward Jones, this is on the back porch gallery at Carnton, so I think it's so cool that both of those men were there and have been there where their um, great, 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 great where David's great, 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 great grandfather was there that night um, after the Battle of Franklin. And Roland Ward Jones died about three weeks ago, almost a month ago. And uh, David has been going through all of his, uh, all of his um, you know, possessions, but he found a safety deposit box he apparently did not know about. This is so cool. All right, this is one more where they're out riding. They, they used to take all these treks together and find uh, where people are buried, and that's, um, that's one of the family cemeteries um, that they visited. But um, what's, so, what's so cool is we have never had a picture of Elizabeth Clouston. We had a picture of Roland later in life, but not of, not of Elizabeth. And this is what we think. We still have to, but he just sent this to me yesterday. My, he was blowing up, we share a Dropbox now. He was blowing up our Dropboxes um, with people at Carnton and my Dropbox with all of these wonderful pictures. But we think this is Cena, Lizzie's, the heroine, and with this pledge, we think this is her mother. And then, um, and then Lizzie Clouston, which, you know, I'm a history nerd, so I just think that this is, this is so very, so very cool. Um, but again, um, I realize things that I learned while um, writing with this pledge is I realize that I, I haven't been nearly as grateful for what uh, men and women in the military, but specifically in this battle, basically the Civil War ended that night of November 30th, 1864. It was done. Some didn't know it yet. But they, um, these people paid for my freedom and your freedom with their very blood. And far too often, I believe, I take that too casually. And we banter about freedom pretty casually these days. And I think it's very good for us to remember what that freedom cost. I learned yet again that only what we do for God will last. Everything else will fade. So I need to live and treat others um, with eternity in mind. And I'm reminded to give God my dreams, to lay them out before him and see if he doesn't do far more than I could ask or imagine um, with, those, with those ideas and with those plans. I learned that God sets a course before us all, just like he did Lizzie and Roland and those soldiers, the real soldiers that are in this book. And I must keep my eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. I was reminded I need to thoroughly examine my motives and my beliefs and I must be willing when I'm found at fault or when I find that those beliefs are wrong or contrary to the will of God, I need to change. I need to change that and that's part of this book as well. I also saw again through reading so many documents, so many history on this book about America at the time and how easy it is for a country to become so fractured and so divided. Does that not sound somewhat familiar today? A lot of you are nodding, absolutely. Um, and how crucial it is to remember that generations before have spilled their blood and given their lives. And long ago, their blood has soaked the earth, but it still cries out to us, I believe, um, to stay strong and true to the course, to love our country, 
and quite contrary to current culture today, is to love God and to seek his face above all else. I appreciate what the writer in Hebrews says in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that easily, so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. And we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. What am I leaving behind that's going to last? And more rightly, if I were to leave this earth tonight, what have I left behind that's going to last, that's going to stand through the fire and that will last and stand and lead others into eternity into a positive way? I don't know who all is in that huge crowd of witnesses um, that the Hebrews writer is talking about, that huge crowd of witnesses to our life of faith and who may be watching us now. But um, selfishly, I hope if Roland and Lizzie are watching that they won't mind that their love letters are now published in, in a novel. And incidentally, the, letter, the letters from Roland's first, first wife, Susan, I really did have slight guilt with this, but then I realized she, she'd probably be fine with it. She asked Roland after he was done reading her letters to burn them. So Roland did not burn them. He carried them with him, obviously, for the rest of his life and then passed them down to his family. But I'm, and I'm also, I was talking with someone today about writing letters. That is a lost art. 150 years from now, people are going to find a little 140-word characters from us. If you haven't written a letter in a while, do that. Do that. Write that person, whoever God puts on your heart. These letters are the basis for so much of what I've written because they share their hopes and their dreams. And of course, they, they use words we don't use anymore in that beautiful script. But seriously, I hope that they would be pleased with the story that is told as well as all the other soldiers and the thousands of others who gave their, gave their life um, at Franklin that night, both on the Confederate and the Federal side. And to remember their sacrifice and that while we're still a nation divided in too many ways, that we strive to learn from their sacrifices and from the mistakes that they made um, so that history won't repeat itself in our time. Um, thank you so much for your attendance tonight, and I'd like to close this with prayer before the, before the Q&A, if you'll bow with me. Father God, you are faithful and steadfast. You do not alter from day to day. You don't shift like changing shadows. You are the same yesterday. You're the same today, and you're the same tomorrow. Thank you for taking us down roads we wouldn't willingly choose to travel for those roundabout ways. Help us, Father, to glorify your name. Thank you for being a restorer from mending broken things, because we're all broken in one way or the other. Um, And Father, I just pray that you would break us until we're wholly yours. Would you help us to run the race that you have set before us, not someone else's race? Help us not to look at the person beside us and the race they're running and think, I'd rather have that race, but to run the unique race that you have chosen for us. Help us to learn that those who have gone before, like Captain Roland Ward-Jones, Elizabeth Clouston, the Acklands, the McGavicks, the um, the Hardings, and the scores of generations um, who have walked these paths before us, help us to learn from them, to learn from history. Thank you, God, for everyone here tonight, and I just pray that we leave encouraged in your name, and thank you so much um, for the sacrifice of Jesus, and Jesus, I just hope that you would ask, help us to love you more fully. In Jesus' name we all pray, amen, amen and amen. All right. I know some of you, thank you. I know some of you, y'all told me you drove two or three hours to get here, so you please scoot on out if you need to, and thank you so much, truly from the bottom of my heart, thank you for coming and being a part of this, thank you so much. And now, any Q&A, any questions, anything? Okay, we're done then. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Anything you have that you would like to ask about a book or history or about Cindy, things that I know about Cindy or, yeah, yeah. Anything else? No? Okay. Y'all have been a great group. Thank you so much. Thank you. Be careful going home, okay? And I'll be outside um, signing books. Just I'll head straight out there, okay? And if those of you who were in line before, what now? 
Oh, line up in numbers on your sticky note. Look at us. Okay. All right. All right. Thank y'all.